Je réalise que Diego est ici comme full time au uh, début de l'année dernière. Oh, nice! <laughs> Hi, Hi Diego. Diego! Hi, everybody! I miss you a lot! <laughs> Welcome everybody. Um, you can put your camera on if you'd like. It's not mandatory. Uh, only if you're hot. If you're not, uh, please don't. <laughs> uh, but please put your mic off. Uh, that's super important for the class to go well. Uh, you can also follow this class on YouTube live if you prefer. Uh, if Zoom is bugging, it can happen. Uh, you can follow us on the Le Wagon YouTube uh, Brazil. Uh, we are going live there. Uh, can I start, Julia? Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Yes, you can. And I sent the link of the YouTube in the chat. Awesome. Uh, so I let you guys take care of the waiting room. And let me introduce a bit more about Lovagon. Uh, so first thing first, uh, my name is Milen. I'm the city manager for Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and I'm French, that's why I speak English, because you don't want to hear my Portuguese, okay? Uh, a little bit more about Le Wagon, our school, and one of the workshops we're going to do today for you. Uh, so we have been ranked the best coding bootcamp in the past five years, and actually this year we launched our first data science bootcamp. And right away we went into the first 15 uh, best data science bootcamp in the world, so we are very proud of it, and we're also very proud of our community. Uh, when you join Lovagon, you join a community of 9,000 students. All of these students they studied in one of the 40 uh, Lovagon cities. You can study in Rio de Janeiro in English, in Sao Paulo in Portuguese, in Paris in French. I think Berlin is in English. You can go to Singapore, Tokyo, Seoul. It's a big international community. Uh, right now, there is not much travel, as you can imagine, but usually uh, pre-COVID and after COVID, I'm sure it will come back. Uh, the same way uh, we like to visit each other so it's a very very strong community that um, everybody's really happy to join and we're very proud of that uh, something else that i wanted to mention a lot of people believe that when you join the wagon it's to become a developer which is true like by the end of the wagon you have the skills to become a developer to become a data analyst but actually most people don't do that uh, i said that about 50 percent half of our classes become developer, that are analysts, that are scientists, and the other half, they do something else. Uh, they build their own businesses, or they continue in a tech position with their former background, for example, whether it's sales, marketing, law, and they just have new skills that make them more interesting for the job market. Uh, so yeah, please uh, be aware that there's a lot of opportunities out there, and not only become a developer, that analyst, like there's a lot of jobs in tech companies, and a lot of jobs that we even have no idea of right now that will be created in the next year. And for sure, coding, data, machine learning as they is gonna be part of it. So it's really good that you're here today and curious about that because that will be important for your career. Uh, and just a little, as a little reminder, so we offer two types of bootcamp. The web development bootcamp, which is for beginners. If you have no uh, background in coding, this is for you. Uh, me, for example, I was a student at Le Wagon before working here, and this is the bootcamp I did. Uh, my background was law and business. I knew nothing <laughs> about programming, and then I became a developer thanks to that. And then we have the data science bootcamp. This one is not for beginners, okay? You need to have some programming basics. You need to have a really strong uh, math background. Um, and something to know also is bo both programs are offered in both the full-time and part-time format. The full time is two months, uh, Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. until 6.30, 7 p.m. So the whole day, and there's no homework, okay? At night and weekend, you can rest. And the part time is for people who work during the day. So it's Tuesday and Thursday night and Saturday all day. So it's still a lot of sacrifice for six months. You don't have any Saturdays, uh, but it pays off too. And actually our next data science part-time bootcamp will be starting in March. Uh, in both Sao Paulo, the Horizon, uh, and Rio de Janeiro. So if you're interested, please apply, okay? Uh, here are the dates and here are the time, uh, times, the uh, schedule also. <laughs> but if you have any other question about, I don't know, uh, payment, program, career, please feel free to uh, follow us uh, on Instagram, Facebook, everything. You can also contact me directly. 
something else I wanted to tell you, uh, please do not apply last minute, okay? Do not apply, for example, for our bootcamp in March at the beginning of March. No, no, no. Uh, why? Because we have a process to go through before. Uh, the first process uh, is an interview with me or with Anna in Sao Paulo. Uh, it's just to make sure that uh, it's the right decision for you to do Le Wagon. I want to make sure that it's the right next step for your career. Then there's a little challenge to make sure that you have the uh, necessary background to do the bootcamp and actually to give you a little taste of it also. Like if you don't like programming, if you don't like data analytics, if you don't like SQL, if you don't like, I don't know, all of this, we give you a little taste of it before you get into it. So it's really good. And then once you're accepted as a student, before the bootcamp, you have to do 60 hours of prep work. So that's why we do not advise, advise at all to apply last minute, okay? Because you have to prepare all of this to make sure that you can start the bootcamp in the right mindset and be fully ready, okay? And something I wanted to mention also, uh, this Wednesday, we're starting a special uh, workshop program called Startup Start Per 101. Uh, it's in Portuguese, it's online, and it's during lunch break, and it's over three weeks, uh, three Wednesdays, where you can learn three different skills. And basically, we uh, conceived these programs based on like, okay, what do startups employees need to know? And I, we believe the idea, the ideal for you as a startup employee is to understand what your other collaborators do. For example, your designers, developers, data scientists, like what do they do in your startup? So we, we created three workshops. The first one is about programming basics. The second one is about UX and UI design, design basics. And the third one is about data analysis basics also. So it's basically the idea is to understand how it works and to get some basics for your own career also. Uh, so just follow this link if you're interested in it. It's for free, it's online, it's in Portuguese. <laughs> so that's good to know. And feel free to invite your coworkers also. It's a really nice program to do with your startups and with your company, okay? And to know about our next events, uh, next everything, our daily life at Le Wagon, please feel free to follow us everywhere. Uh, this way you'll be knowing about the next news. Uh, that's it for me. I will be staying the whole workshop. So please feel free to use the chat on Zoom or the chat on YouTube if you have questions about the workshop itself. And if you have any question about the bootcamp, I will be putting my contact information also. Okay, okay. And thank you so much, uh, Vinicius, for giving this class today. I hand it over to you now. <laughs> You're welcome, Milan. Um, oh, that's a big room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, hey guys. Uh, I'm, I'm Vinicius or Vinny. Um, so since you're interested in bootcamp, I think it'd be helpful just to tell you a little bit of my background before because I just went through the bootcamp. Um, you know, I, I studied economics um, I went to grad school to study energy, um, didn't, never worked in my field, and I was interested in data science. I took a lot of online classes before um, going to the bootcamp in La Wagon, and um, I not only highly recommend it, um, but um, I can say, at least in my own personal experience, what we do here in nine weeks, uh, if you're working by yourself, um, in case maybe you're a really, really motivated individual, but if not, you know, in nine weeks, you can do the equivalent of like one year worth of work and study. Um, so definitely, you know, the, the time and money they invest in, I think really pays in rewards. Um, and today we're gonna go through machine learning um, or we're gonna learn a little bit about machine learning, just a little introduction. I'm gonna show some slides. Um, if you can, I don't know if Milan or Julia, uh, I'm not able to share my screen. Um, if you can give me the authorization. Just so. Okay, see if you uh, can do it now. But that's Julia. Yeah. It's gonna, it's gonna be English because the bootcamp is in English, but you know, I am Brazilian as well. Um, um, okay, so you can share my screen. Okay, so we should be good. Um, in case there's any technical issues, uh, if you can just let me know. Um, guys, I think most of you are Brazilian. Uh, you're aware that sometimes internet, uh, you know, can be dodgy here. So if, if, we, uh, if there's any uh, 
delay or if I'm frozen, just wait a little bit and I should be right back. Um, so, you know, they, we try to make learning somewhat fun, um, you know, and not very serious. So we start off with what the hell is machine learning? Um, and I think um, it's still a bit of a buzzword, um, machine learning, um, you know, from I think a couple of years, um, okay. from a couple of years, like when this started getting really popular, you know, it was a big buzzword. If you're, if you got a new company and if you're using machine learning, I think your funding, you know, just increases tenfold. Um, but it's good to just, I guess, be realistic with it. Uh, what it is, what isn't, you know, it can be called AI, but it, I think at least in the basic that stuff that we're going to do, you're going to see that, you know, it's not as magical or uh, complicated as, you know, it seems. Um, so, um, just a little background from, from Le Wagon, you know, they've, they've done, um, they've been doing this for a while. Um, it's highly, uh, it's highly, <laughs> uh, ranked, uh, bootcamp. Uh, you can see online with some, some of the bootcamp review sites and stuff. Um, and, you know, all we're going to be learning is just a tool. Um, it really depends on what you do with it. Um, uh, it doesn't matter if you have this like beautiful model, just really, really complex model. Uh, if you, if you didn't want to do anything interesting with it. Um, so we're just going to go through over what is machine learning really basically what is not uh, and we're going to do a couple models just to uh, just to get our, our feet wet. Um, so what is it? Uh, I guess it's just a, a you know, standard definition uh, which uh, it's re regularly computers do exactly what we tell them to do. Um, and machine learning, the computer uh, or the program, your model is going to have ability to learn, um, sort of, sort of by itself. You know, it has an algorithm uh, that tries to minimize uh, a loss function, um, and that way, it just it looks at some data and tries to best fit it in the case of regressions or just re um, reduce this loss function, uh, and some magical results come from it. Um, you know, with some regular programming. You just have input and output, that's it. You know, it does exactly only, it does what you, to, what you tell it to do and only that. And uh, with machine learning, you know, sometimes uh, the program does things that you, you know, you, you didn't explicitly tell it to do because it's looking through some data and trying to um, get an algorithm to minimize its loss function. And then after your model is ready, you can, you know, you, after you train your model, you can retrain it with some new data you can test it, you know, with outside data that you that it didn't learn on, um, and just by this these kind of simple um, algorithms, you can get some some really incredible results. Um, so just uh, just to correct this this phrase, you know, programming methods they use experience to recognize complex patterns and create formula for new predictions. Uh, we can substitute experience with data. Uh, because that's really what we're giving our models. It's just data. Um, and then we're going to create some models. Um, you know, you probably have heard of machine learning models, uh, big data, you know, a lot of buzzwords. Um, this, especially nowadays with the, the cheap computing power, just being able to go through, you know, a huge amount of data and a lot of data that's generated. Um, we can get some amazing results because machine learning is nothing new. Um, you know, it might have been, it might be trendy now, but this has been around for decades. It's just that you didn't have all the computing power that we do today, and you didn't have as much data as we do today. Um, in a really, really basic sense, um, you might not really understand what the slide says, but in a really, really basic sense, um, this is an example of some data. You have a bunch of dots; they are either red or yellow. Um, and you're gonna, we're gonna train a model that recognizes this pattern. Um, really, it can be that simple, you know, about guessing, you know, we'll give you two red dots and one yellow dot over and over again. And then we'll train a model that's gonna tell us what the next dot is. In this case, clearly it's gonna be a yellow dot. Um, so when people say that AI is gonna take over the world, some people like to show really basic examples of AI, and this is one of the case, and then you, you 
kind of question, how is this AI gonna take over the world? Um, we have a lot of different things that we can do in machine learning. Um, uh, one nice split is between supervised and unsupervised learning. Uh, we're just gonna do supervised learning today, some basic supervised learning, but um, we do have examples of unsupervised learning. Um, one trendy example is deep learning, where you can have uh, artificial neural networks um, and you feed in a lot of data, for example, image recognition. So uh, now if you, if you have a um, facial recognition software, you know, it's, it's probably doing some sort of deep learning to, to recognize faces. Uh, the only difference is that, you know, with, with supervised learning, we're, we're telling the, the algorithm what, is, what it should look at. So we're gonna give it the features that we're gonna, we're gonna see a bit, in a little bit. Uh, in still unsupervised learning, the, our models are able to detect patterns by itself without being explicit told, you know, what patterns it should look for. Um, and when you, when you come to like really, really rich data, uh, that's, that's a more useful tool. Um, so yeah, today we're just going to do uh, regression and classification. Uh, you might've seen regression before. We're going to go over this. So how does it work? Uh, we have some data here, you know, the simple table with age and height. Um, so uh, I'll just go back. So, you know, we can, you can think of the input or output. So if I give you Let's say we, have, we want a model that if I give you someone's age, we, you can predict its height. Um, so when it comes to machine learning, um, you can also think of the, of the input as the features of, of a model and, um, and the output is a target. Um, so we'll get to, to do that, we'll get some data. Um, you know, we have here age and height. And I'm just gonna, um, it's again, pretty basic. Um, you can draw a line, you know, in this case, you know, we're just, we're just connecting the dots, but you could draw a best fit line in this case. And it's not, it doesn't take, you know, any geniuses to see that, you know, once you go from 12 to 13, your height's probably going to increase a little bit. And then you just take an average slope of this line and you predict, you know, how, how high you are. Pretty easy to do by hand, you know, anyone can do that. Um, the, the trick is when, when we come to like really, really complex data and not just a two dimensional uh, data set. Um, so yeah, if, in this case, you just had one feature. If you have 150 features, then, you know, you can't really plot it. it it's a bit easier to see. And if you just have millions of observations then it becomes exponentially difficult. Uh, and that's something that some apps might have every day. You know, they just have so much user data that um, it's it'd be impossible to, to do it by hand. Um, machine learning is used in pretty much pretty much everywhere. You know, I, you know, every any kind of app that we use has machine learning models running for all kinds of of reasons. You have models running on top of models, um, and Um, so yeah, one, one good example is computer vision. So um, autonomous vehicles are, you know, a trendy topic. Um, and if you want to program a car to drive by itself, the first thing you have to do is to be able to, you know, see where it's going to detect, to, to detect objects. Uh, one way that you can do this is just take just images. Um, and uh, in this case, you can see the, the, the the boxes that classify objects. Um, the way this um, well, this can be done in a couple of different ways, but basically, you know, you feed in to your model a lot of images, uh, and you tell the model what those are. So, for example, uh, you fill in a lot of images, and you you draw a little box where it says, "Hey, this is a person. This is a car. This is a traffic light," um, and your, your deep learning model just goes through a lot of data and learns little patterns, you know? So it might learn the contours that make up a person. Uh, it, might, it might learn, uh, and the trick is that, you, you know, you, sometimes it's a black box, so you don't know exactly what your model is learning. So for example, we, we might look at this and think, 
oh, look, you know, there's, there's these taxi cabs. How do I learn that a car is a taxi cab? Well, maybe you uh, actually, uh, in this case, it's not, it's not actually classified as taxi cabs, uh, but let's take traffic lights. So how do you learn you know, a traffic light? We might think, oh, it's three lights, you know, one on top of the other, uh, one red, one yellow, one green. But um, there might be easier ways to classify, at least from the model's perspective. It might just learn that you know, traffic lights have one red light and that's a traffic light. And any other red light, it might classify as a traffic light as well. Uh, in this case, you know, um, the model doesn't generalize. It can only you know, recognize specific instances of traffic light. Um, and that, that is a, a problem you know, when, with machine learning and with deep learning models. Uh, you, sometimes you just never know exactly what your model is seeing, but it still it can be very useful. Um, so recommendation engines for you know, Netflix or you know, Amazon to see what other people buy, those are all the machine learning models. And um, uh, natural language processing, so bots, you might have might have like used the chatbot before, um, you know, those machine learning models that, that do that. Um, there's some very complex ones. Um, you might've seen that Google just came out with uh, a model that can like, actually write kind of like a human, um, got a lot of buzz. It's called GP3, if I'm not mistaken. It wrote an article in The Guardian just by itself after giving a couple of sentences. Um, so when you work on time series data, um, financial markets is quite popular, um, though that can be tricky. So, you know, you, you're trying to predict the future based on the past, which is great. You know, it might work for 99% of the time it works, but then every now and then, you know, maybe every hundred years or so, uh, a global pandemic um, happens and your models just go to hell because it just, it never seen a pandemic before, so it can't predict um, and um, yeah, we, when it comes to fraud detection, so um, your credit card companies work, use machine learning models to detect fraud. Um, sometimes, um, you know, if you, if you have, um, let's say you sign in to your email account from a new computer, right? It might ask, oh, hey, was this you? Uh, or Facebook might ask that. You know, it's just an algorithm that kind of sees out oh, well. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a high chance that um, someone signing in from a new location or computer could be, um, you know, someone trying to hack that account. So let me make sure, let me send a little email to um, to make sure that it's that person. Um, so even though we can do a lot of useful things, sometimes, you know, people really hype it up and um, you can kind of extrapolate uh, these good results to and say that it can do everything you know anything and everything it's not always the case i mean it's maybe theoretical theoretically possible but uh not really viable yet um so what is not machine learning um just so i'll just put these um so some things you might need machine learning for so if you want to do a bit of prediction so predicting salaries of, of potential hirings hires you know that that takes prediction that takes machine learning uh, when you're just looking at data, so do men and women earn the same in our company? You don't need a machine learning model for that. You just need someone to look through all the salaries and, you know, uh, see if, if men and women are the same. So if you want to predict, uh, oh, sorry, if you want to look, um, see why um, a marketing channel brings the most clicks, you know, might need some machine learning, but you don't need it to figure out which marketing channel brings the most clicks. That is just about looking at the data. Um, so when you when you're trying to what if? So if you if you're trying to see your company's going to work open a new country and how will sales look? You know you make some predictions. You know it's it's always uncertain. You're just trying to make uh, a good prediction. Um, and for next quarter, you can again just look at your data to see that. Um, though, you know if, if you're trying to predict something in the future, you might need machine learning, but uh, sometimes with your data, you can just extrapolate from uh, your current data. Um, another problem is when you're missing the ground truth. So you might not really know what you're looking for. So in the case of uh, the perfect candidate for a job position, um, you know, it takes some time to actually figure out what, what is the perfect candidate, what makes the perfect candidate. Um, you can't just 
necessarily take get a model and tell it to figure out for you. Um, they might not, not know what to look for. Uh, in these two examples, it's the difference between playing Go uh, and being a plumber um, or doing some plumbing work. Um, Go, there, Google has this really famous, um, oh no, I'm sorry, it's not, it's, it's a Google-owned lab called DeepMind. They, um, uh, they work usually with deep learning, but they have these, uh, these AI systems that got really famous for winning uh, games. So um, I think it started with StarCraft, which is a computer game. Then they went into some of the games. Then Go is a game that I've never played, but I think it's famous for it being hard to solve. You know, it's, you can't just, like chess, there's, it's a huge number of combinations of, uh, in a chess game, but you can have a solution for it. Uh, some games you just, you, you can't, you can't just, uh, just brute force a solution. You know, you have to know how to play and Go is one of them. And Google got, this lab got famous for being able to beat the best players um, in Go in the world. Uh, but some other things, you know, like uh, with the game, you know, like either you win or lose or you can see scores, but uh, some other stuff is hard to measure, like what success is. So um, I didn't make the slides, but I'm just, I'm just guessing here that when it comes to plumbing work, uh, there's a lot of things that, um, that you can measure and it's hard to, uh, to measure success. Though a simple measure of success would be if it leaks or not, uh, there are other, other things related. Um, so if you want to do a, a, little, a little analysis here, it's just, again, very simple, like the age thing. Each day, your, uh, your dose is increasing by five milligrams. Uh, so what do you think is going to be on the, day? on the sixth day? You, know, you can just add on five milligrams. Um, so a little uh, comic here, uh, which I'll let you guys read, but you know, if you take, if you try to extrapolate from a small amount of data, you might have some trouble. This doesn't happen just with small amounts of data, but uh, this is something that I think it's always something to be careful about when working with data. Uh, you know, if, if someone gets married tomorrow, if you started measuring today her number, a uh, number of husbands of, of, of a woman that gets married tomorrow, tomorrow, today she has zero husbands, tomorrow she has one husband. Uh, so you just think, okay, one husband per day. So in the end of the year, you have 365 husbands. Uh, you know, it's not really the case. Um, and when we train our models, right, uh, the models are just only going to be as good as the data that we feed them. Um, so, I mean, you might have, if you ever use, Excel, which I'm sure a lot of you have used, you know, when you try to extrapolate, so, you know, you take two rows and you, you go down, when you forget to actually take the, uh, the, the trend, you know, so if you're increasing by one each row, if you just take the first one, it's just, it's just copying it. Um, and sometimes that's what machine learning is and that results in terrible mistakes. Um, and just to go back to that, to the thing I said earlier, um, you know, a lot of algorithms were breaking during the pandemics, the, during the, during the, when the pandemic started, just because it's never seen a pandemic. You know, you can't, it's really hard for you to make a prediction about, about something when you're using past data and you have, you know, maybe a black swan event, something that your, your data just doesn't include. So your model has never seen that before. Uh, I'm sure this is a problem um, during the financial crisis as well, you know, you had, you had these, um, housing prices going down in the U S, uh, after decades of housing prices only going up. So some models just couldn't, uh, they just couldn't compute the fact that housing prices could go down. I mean, that was pretty much taken as a certainty. It's, it's always important to go back and make sure that the things you're taking for certain really are certain. So again, you know, just a code to reiterate that some companies will tell you that they have a machine learning model, you know, they're using an AI to make some sort of prediction, you know, or, and really it's just kind of simple regressions, simple linear regression, you have a ordinary least squares that we're gonna go and do in a bit uh, on some nice cleanup data. That's, sometimes that's all it takes. Uh, and, uh, mantra, I think, for machine learning, maybe just data 
uh, science in general is trash in, trash out. So if your data is trash, um, doesn't matter how good you a model you you make, you know, like you you maybe you take the most complex model that there is, and you think, oh, this is going to work great, but your data is trash, your predictions are probably going to be trash as well. Um, so just to get our feet wet, uh, we're going to go do a simple regression now. Um, and if you've never seen a linear regression, it's in two dimensions, it's kind of making a best fit line. You know, you're going to have a bunch of scatter points and you just take and you make a nice pretty line that goes through them in the best way possible. Um, to go back to the, the code, you know, um, a lot of firms think that they want a really complex solution to their problems, but sometimes a simple tool will do. Um, and why, you know, are we going to look in regression? Simply because it's the most, uh, or it was the most used machine learning method uh, at least a couple of years ago, uh, according to this poll. Um, and we got a bunch of different ones. So, you know, this is just one, but it is very useful uh, for a lot of problems. So we'll go to a little demo. Let me just uh, wait. So I don't know if you guys will be quoting along. Uh, I know that there's some, some tools online that you can um, use to quote along and um, you're more welcome to do so. Um, and I'll try to do it in a space that if you are coding along, you, know, you might be able to follow. Um, but if you're not, you know, you won't be too slow. Um, again, this is always tricky when it comes to uh, making a demo because uh, it's hard to know what your background is. So uh, there's a famous quote, I think, or a meme uh, from Carl Sagan, a famous physicist that says, uh, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you need to first uh, invent the universe. Um, so if we want to make a um, machine learning model from scratch, there's a lot of things that we need to do. I mean, we could spend days just talking about how a computer works uh, and what, you know, math is like what calculus is, all, all kinds of things. Um, and sorry, I'm just gonna, bef before starting, I guess I'll just uh, go through the, the chat really quick just to answer questions. Uh, James asked if R is efficient for machine learning. Uh, yeah, I mean, R is, I think, a lot of the, the stuff that we do in Python, you can do in R. I think just Python is, um, I think it's just more popular, you know, uh, it might be a little easier to use. Um, I've actually have barely seen R uh, when I used to do regressions. Uh, uh, so research with mostly regressions, it was, um, uh, I did Stata, uh, which is not as popular, but you know, another uh, statistical software. Uh, so you can do a lot of stuff in R, you know, if we're just looking at linear regression, um, R is made for that, you know, R, if we're, you guys that don't know R is a statistical software, um, you know, so a lot of people can program in R. R is very useful for, for, large, for large data. But um, I would say that mostly Python is, um, I mean, Python can be used for a lot of different things. So you can do web development in Python, you can do, um, you know, you can build apps in Python. Uh, Python is very intuitive. So as a, as a programming language, it, I would say it's probably the easiest one to learn. Um, so James, you know, you, you don't know Python. Um, I'll, I'll give some simple examples of Python thing, but I would say like, don't, don't be scared of Python. It's very, um, it's, it's very intuitive. Sometimes um, in Python, you don't know what, what the code is for something and you just guess it and it works because it's, it's, it's built to be easy. Um, so when it comes to, um, we, we have different data types uh, in Python, right? So you can have a string. Um, a string is just some words. Um, so, you know, I can, um, well, a string will be a string. Uh, we usually put quotes in, you know, you can do double quotes for a string. You can also do uh, single quotes in Python. 
Um, don't know what missing those books is. Um, sometimes it matters, sometimes it does. Mostly you can, you can use them in the changing. Um, so this would be a string, it's a data type. Um, another data type is integer, which is just numbers, you know? So uh, one, you can do a math mathematical operation. So you can do one plus two. And if you run this cell, uh, you know, it just adds for you. And you, know, you can do whatever, you can divide, um, you can multiply. Um, the difference between strings and floats, floats are also numbers, is that you have the, the floating points. So, you know, uh, one is an integer, um, but 1.0 is a float. Um, sometimes you need um, whole numbers, you know, you need integers, sometimes you need decimals. Uh, a variable is something that you can set. So you can make a variable, uh, so I'll just, you know, name a variable, you can name it whatever you want. So I want to name noodle, just, just show you that. And you can set it equal to one. Um, in this case, if I call it again, so right, let's say if I print noodle, it's going to just print what it is. Now I can set it again to, you know, string. This way my variable is going to be a string. And if I print it again, it's just going to print it. Um, you know, it's quite simple, but um, um, with just simple methods, you know, when you compound them, you can do um, um, uh, complex things. Uh, and I, I did say method, but you know, methods are just uh, functions um, that are called on objects. So, um, you know, one thing that we can do in Python, for example, uh, we can do lists. So we can have a list of numbers. Let's say one, two, three. That's going to be a, um, uh, a list, uh, and we use these uh, the square brackets for them. Um, and that that's a type of object. Everything in Python is an object. It's an object um, uh, oriented language. I might be saying that wrong, but anyways. Um, so you have all these these methods, which are functions that you can call these objects. So, for example, um, you can. Um, add on to this list. So if I do my list, I can call this end method, which is um, just going to add something to the end. So for example, I can do string. And this way, if I come back here and I call my, uh, my variable that I made, now it's a list with the numbers that I made. And then in the end, I add this. And append is just a method that goes um, that it belongs to the, the object list, which is another data type. There's other data types in Python, um, but uh, we'll leave this for, for some other time. So to start with um, machine learning, um, Python has some cool libraries that are really good for data science. So pandas uh, is very useful uh, for data science, which lets you work with data frames. Um, you think of data frames as sort of a table in Excel. Um, NumPy for mathematical operations is really good. And Seaborn is a data visualization uh, library, which lets you plot and graph um, your data. Um, so when I'm importing, it's just so I can use these libraries, right? So the way it works, usually you install it in your computer, and then you import so you can, so you can use them. Uh, is if you don't, then it just, it's not automatically um, uh, available for you. Um, so when it comes to doing any kind of data analysis, um, if you're working with machine learning, anything that you're looking at data, the, really the first thing you want to do is get your data. Uh, in this case, I have this data set salaries, which is a CSV file. Um, uh, if you guys don't know, CSV just means comma separated values just a way of storing data. Um, I think I have it here. So just to show you guys, this is an example, just the five uh, first rows of um, the data set. And, you know, just as a curiosity, um, actually, I'm only sure, but it's just like a text. Uh, all, all these, uh, all this is just stored as text and they're separated by commas. Uh, so a huge sort of text file with 
a whole lot of lines. Um, if I take out, so uh, first I loaded, uh, so PD is pandas. Um, because programmers are just really, really lazy, so they try to make everything as short as possible. That's why you import as pandas as PD. So uh, in this case, I don't have to write pandas every time, I can just write PD. Um, and read is something, a uh, read CSV is from pandas. It just takes a CSV file and turns it into this nice uh, uh, table here for us. Uh, anyways, if, if I don't do, uh, I just call salaries, which is a data set. It's gonna give me the whole thing. It's abbreviated in the middle. It shows, you know, all of it. Um, we have over 1800 rows, you know, which is a lot. Um, in Jupyter Notebook, um, which is what we're using, maybe I should have done this you know, it's a, Jupyter Notebook is a really nice way to write your code and, and, and execute it at the same time, you know, um, sometimes you might have to actually write your code in a text, uh, like a code editor, like Sublime, or a Visual Studio Code, uh, and then run it. Um, in Jupyter, we can we have these nice little um, cells that we can put some blocks of code and then execute it. Um, um, so if we go, you know, we load our, our data set, um, we have a, a quick look at it. Um, we see all our columns. So just to go back to the machine learning uh, terminology, a lot of times we call these features, right? So um, these are our inputs into the data. Um, we in this case, which we were trying to look at salary. So salary is the gross. So this is gross salary. Um, each line, each row is a different em employee. So, you know, let's say this, this first guy, we have our first employee, we have Jenner for him. Uh, Jenner is as a dummy variable. Um, so it's a, it's a binary that takes zero or one in this case. Um, again, um, I don't wanna be well, okay. Uh, yeah, I really don't want to be controversial <laughs> in this and say that uh, gender is binary. Uh, it's whatever. Um, th this is just for <laughs> the uh, this data analysis. Please, uh, I did not, I did not make this data set. Don't blame me uh, if this offenses you. But um, pretty much, it takes a one, a value of one, if the employee is male. In, in the company, um, uh, in the company, um, uh, in, from, in the company data. Um, we have age, the department, um, also for the departments, uh, we have a code, which sometimes makes it look easier when you have a, a classification like that. So, you know, the, the label, this is non-numerical data. Sometimes it's easier to, to turn um, data that's non-numerical into numerical data. Uh, the user experience in the company, um, and oof, tenure is in months. Okay. Um, now we have the salary. So we have all these features and we have our target. Our target is gross, which is salary. Um, again, you know, we're just looking at it a little more. Um, now, one thing that, you know, could be uh, useful here. So if you're working with, with data sets on, uh, you know, with pandas, one thing that you can always call is describe, which is can be very useful. Now, describe is just gonna give you sort of the, uh, the descriptive statistics of all our columns. Um, so you can see up top is the count. You know how many values you have for each of these uh, these columns. You know our features, um, and we have a couple of uh, you know basic statistics. So the mean, the average. Of, of each of these. Uh, you can see here the department, it's, it's, it's out because, you know, these, you can't take the, the average of, you know, these labels, you know, operation, some tech. Um, another thing we have is the standard deviation, you know, for you guys that have some basic knowledge of statistics, you might know what that is. Uh, the means, the average, the standard deviation just kind of tells you how your data is spread, you know, so uh, if you have a very small standard deviation, 
the, most of your data is going to be pretty close to your mean, so to the average. Uh, things are not going to be uh, very far away from the average. If your standard deviation is very large, it means that things vary quite a bit. You know, so you're going to have data that 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 is quite far from from your average. Um, then min is just the minimum value for the data. Um, 25%, 50%, 70%. Um, these are, um, so just to start with 50%, that's, that's also equal to the medium. Um, and the medium is just the value at which 50% of your data lies below it and 50% of your data lies above it. So it's a halfway point between the data. And the same thing with 25 and 75%. You know, you can divide these into quartiles of your data. You might hear that sometimes. You know, so the first quartile, second quartile, third quartile. Um, and max is just the maximum value of your data. Um, so it's sometimes it's good to just have a quick look at this when you try to understand um, um, your data set and the values. Uh, one good thing just to note is that when you're talking about um, uh, dummy a dummy variable, which I talked about gender in this case, it is, it just takes a value of one or zero. Um, you know, this, this, the descriptive of statistics tells us a little bit more. Because in this case, since we know that male employees take the value of one here, the mean of that is just the percentage of employees that are male. So just by looking at the mean here, uh, we can say that 27% are, are men. You know, so our data set, we have way more, um, way more women in our data set than we do uh, men. Which is not necessarily a problem, but it could be, you know, if you're trying to to extrapolate the data, uh, the data that we get here through some other things, uh, you know, maybe in other in another company you're gonna have the majority of employees be male, and then that could create some problems. Um, so um, as we're going back, you know, we can um, we looked into some um, descriptive um, statistics. But it can be also very useful to um, to visualize your data, uh, and in that case, we will use um, uh, Seaborn, which is the library. So you know, just a quick thing, we can do a, a, a scatter plot. So we import it as SNS, and there's a nice is scatter plots. So we can make a uh, if if you guys haven't ever seen uh, a scatter plot before. Uh, Oh, you're about to. Uh, it's pretty easy to understand. So in this case, we just got to um, um, get what our data is. So the data is going to be equal to um, salary, which is the data set that we uh, we just made. And then this is going to be a um, uh, you know a two dimensional graph. Um, so we get to define our x and y. So um, will in this case find x. Um, something useful here would be the years of experience. So years of experience and y be equal to our salary, which is uh, in this case is just called gross. But um, if we if we run this we're gonna a nice little plot. This is scatter plot. Scatter plot is just called scatter plot because you scatter a bunch of points. So we can see all of the, the points in graph. On the y-axis we have salary, and um, on the x-axis we have years of experience. Now, just by looking at this, you know we can we can make some some inferences. You know we can kind of see that the more years of experience an employee has, the higher salary it. His or her salary is, um, you know, we, we have we can kind of already see this trend trending up, um, but you know we're going to run um, a linear regression model just to um, um, just to see. Um, before before I do this split, um, so we have this and. Um, I'm just gonna get some code that I already posted in here. So actually, so another thing that we can do is 
we can make different uh, colors for different types of employees. In this case, I just made a nice little um, uh, separation between um, men and women in this case. And here we can see sort of the same, I mean, again, you don't have to do this visually, but it's good just to look at it. You know, we can kind of see a similar trend, no matter if it's if we're talking about men or women uh, in, in this graph. And then now we can, um, we can do some, uh, we can actually run a model. So, um, in this case, we, uh, I'm gonna separate the, our data set into uh, input and output. So our input in this case, or let's just use our X, it's gonna be our data set. But we don't want the, we, we don't want our X to include um, um, our target, which is a salary, right? So we might want to just drop it um, from the analysis. Again, this, when we do this, so if I drop here, and we have a salary. Another thing is this non-numerical non um, um, column here, department. Um, it'd be, we made this department code so we can work with it, and so we can you know, take away the department. Um, when it comes to, so, I mean, this, this is something for um, when, you, when you're working with this, right? So you can, um, if I drop up, so just, just, so, if I drop this, So just to so you guys see, no. Is it permit code? Cool. Yeah, so permit code is the numerical one, and then we can drop the permit. So just, just for the sake of time, so you can see it that just making mistakes. I just never. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna. Um, when we look at X here. Excuse me, I believe it's because the name is department underline code above. That's why he's not finding the department line. Okay, so, Jay, we'll say that again. Sorry, I believe it's because the name department on the axis is department underline code. Um, I believe we have to specify the name, the full name, I guess. Right, right, you mean here. We do have both, right? So we have, we're gonna have two columns. One is right. department code and department. Um, and uh, the department code, you know, we, we make this column usually just for, so we have an American column uh, that, we can, that we can use. Um, you know, in this case, like, you know, when we, um, when we run a regression, uh, we're going to have weights, um, sort of like the slope of each variable. Um, you know, so when we look here, um, if we make a, um, a, a simple thing, so, you know, all, all we're doing when we're doing regressions really is this, so. much when we when we run a regression all we're doing is um, something like this so we're running a best fit line um over our data right uh, now of course this is just just one problem so it's just years of experience um we run a best fit line um we're trying to minimize sort of pretty much like minimize the distance we're, we're plotting a line that minimizes um the distance between the points and the line 
So, you know, you can run a bunch of, you can draw a bunch of different lines that kind of fits this data, or it looks like it fits this data. But uh, regression is just going to minimize the actual distance between these points and our line. Um, it's not really the distance because you're, you're minimizing this the squared errors, which is you know, you're taking this, this distance and squaring it. But uh, what, what happens in this case is that when you have outliers, so a point very distant from the line, uh, that gets weighed more, um, you know, because it's the square of the distance. But, you know, we're just doing this. Uh, and in this case, we're just doing it with one variable, which is years of experience. Because we want to go on a data set and find out what all these variables um, influence, then we're kind of getting slopes. You know, if you think of, you know, from a 2D graph, you can go to a 3D graph, and you might have visualized that before. But we can also go to, you know, uh, many dimensions. In that case, you can't really visualize it. And you're just looking at the slope that each thing, um, you can isolate one, you know, so you can say, if I hold age constant, how does, um, sorry, here. If I hold age constant, how does going from tech to operations, how much does that influence my salary? Um, but you know, we, we're doing all of that simultaneously. So you know, you want to create the specific line. Um, so we have our X, um, which in this case, if I call it, so um, you know, um, we can look at the difference. So here, pretty much it's the same thing, but I don't have gross, which is a salary, and I don't have the department. I still have the department coach. Um, and um, um, I did be working with that. And if I may now, we're gonna we we made our x. We uh, we want to create our y now. So our y is just gonna be um, the salary scroll. So we can call this. Um, this is just the column of salary, you know. Um, it's all uh, over 1,800 salaries of, of salaries. And uh, we can make that equal to our Y. Great, so um, this is something that we're supposed to do, which is split our data into features and targets. Um, well, actually, we, we, we already done that, so um, this was just my mistake. Okay. Um, Later on, we will actually have to uh, split the data into uh, training data and, uh, and validation data. So uh, we've done this, I'm just gonna do it again. And now we're gonna import the actual a linear regression model. Um, this is part of another library called sklearn. Um, and I have it here, sorry. My, uh, in the future, and this is the first frame. So this is sklearn. Um, um, this is our linear regression model. This is the documentation page, you know? So everything that we use, either you want to use something in Python, uh, if you want to use something for any of the libraries, so we saw Pandas, we have saw Seaborn, we saw NumPy, you can always just look at the documentation, um, which in some cases it's better than others. So, you know, um, sometimes you search for documentation, it's great, it makes perfect sense. Some documentation is a bit tricky to understand, but it's always always good for you know if you just Google so you know whatever you want to use in this case you know we are losing using um, scikit learn um, linear regression uh, we can always go here you know so uh, we call it which is what we're going to do here we're going to uh, equal model uh, equal linear regression we're just going to do it uh, reason why here we are. Uh, Sometimes typos um, really ruin your code. But um, we have all, uh, in this case, we have all these parameters that we can define. Uh, but they're already um, sort of by default. Some of them are defined for us. Um, so we can call it with nothing, and we already have a model. Um, 
you know, so um, when we go out, well, now we initialize, we have, we have this model, we got to put some data in it. So, you know, once, um, once we have this model, we're going to sort of fit into our data. Um, so we call this, uh, this method fit. And then in this case, I'm just going to put our X and the Y. Um, and um, this really is where um, like the magic, you know, if, if you think about um, what we're trying to do, which is make this line of, of best fit. Uh, now the model is fitting it, you know, like we, we initialize it, now we're, we're putting it in the data so we can find the, fit, the best fit line. Um, and after that, you know, we can um, score a model. Um, so why? Um, um, this is a bit tricky because you know, we're kind of scoring a model on the data that we fit it, which is to be uh, automatic. But really, like, you know, when it comes down to it, all we're trying to do is we're trying to get this data. We made that best line, and we're going to sort of try to, to predict a, um, a new, um, something new, like a new data set, which is this one's here, which is not, um, it was not in the data to begin with. So, you know, if we, um, I'm sorry, so, um, if, if we just look into it quickly, um, this, um, this um, array, you know, um, it's just really just a list, it's a list of numbers. Um, it doesn't mean anything by itself, but we can come back here um, on, sorry. So I'll just, I'll just put it here. So if we just go back, I call X. Uh, head is just going to be the five. So I have here, you know, gender, age, and parent code. This list here just means that, um, you know, at least, at least when it comes to this model, it just means that gender is going to be equal to one or male. Uh, age is 15, which is a bit weird. Um, you know, that should be illegal, but whatever. Um, primary code is seven, uh, which I think that was tech. Um, and with 5.2 years of experience, which, you know, amazing. This 15 year old started working in the company at 10. Um, so, you know, genius guy. Um, and we're gonna predict um, salary, which is a bit weird. I mean, if you look at it, like um, not only are you, uh, um, is, is the salary isn't even low, it's just, um, uh, it's negative. Um, so just, we do another hire, um, you know, so the same, everything, everything the same, uh, but between 15, I'll, I'll go to a 35 year old. Now we have a salary that makes sense, you know, 162,000. Um, now, like this is useful to see sort of some things that we talked about before, which is when you have, uh, when you have something that, you're trying to predict something that your data has never seen before, you know? So you're trying to predict maybe the future, or in this case, in the future, it's just like, oh, you know, what if we have this 15 year old? What, what should we pay him or what will his salary be? Um, the problem is that most likely, you know, and we can verify this, there are no people that are 15 in the company. So when we, we did this describe and we saw the similar statistics, we saw that the minimum age is 21, you know? Uh, there's, Max age is 56, so you know, a lot of young people in this company, but not so young that they're teenagers, you know, and they start working at 10. Um, so, you know, what happens is the weight for, for age um, will just make the, cal the salary decrease so much that um, a 15 year old should get a negative salary. Um, and this might be a little, um, a little confusing at first, but um, we can, some, some models, some, some machine learning models are uh, what we call like black boxes, which means that um, you put stuff in and you get a result. 
you have no idea what's happening inside. You know, there's, there's an input, there's a model that's like a box, black box, and then you have an output. Uh, it's really hard to understand what the model is doing, what the model is giving importance to, what kind of weights, uh, you know, you can, you can get a result, but sometimes you just don't know. You know, you, you have an input, you have an output, it works most of the time. If it, if it doesn't work, it's really hard to figure out why it doesn't work, you know, um, why, why are you giving weird results? Um, so in this case, you know, if we, um, um, you know, we got the 15 year old, so I'll just put it, put the 15 year old back in here uh, and we'll get this, this negative salary, you know, so he should be paying us 27,000 to work, um, which I mean, kind of, kind of happens, you know, if you think about like interns, they work for free or for an amount that's so low, so low, that's almost like, you know, you're, you're paying to work. Um, and some people are willing to really, you know, pay to work to get, you know, the experience. But we know that this doesn't make sense. So something that we can do, at least with linear regression, is we can get more efficient, which um, um, we call like this, or uh, model. And now going back, you know, we have all of the features here, you know, gender, age, code, years, experience, tenure. Um, and now we can see, you know, so gender, uh, it's, it's just binary. Um, we, oh, actually, I, I'm assuming that I made a mistake, guys. So I was saying that one means um, male um, workers. Um, I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and you know, hopefully not be crucified. That said that since it's a negative coefficient, since having the gender one has a negative, um, you, it means your salary would be lower then one is actually female. Um, and, um, you know, it would make more sense given the reality of the world, but, you know, don't, don't read too much into this. It's just uh, the data set. It could, it could be male as well. Um, and so, you know, if someone is, is female, we expect them to have, you know, about 25,000 less in salary just by being sex. This is just a binary. So, you know, you see either uh, one or zero, but when it comes to age, you know, that's, uh, that's a continuous um, value. Um, so, you know, as the older you get, you know, one year, uh, we about 10,000 more in salary, uh, which is, you know, quite a bit. If you think, if you look at it, um, the value for, for I mean, it's, it, it should be, I guess, like a bit shocking, but not surprising. Again, this is not a, uh, I, it's not a, like a real data set, uh, I don't believe, you know, of a real company, but, you know, it should be shocking, but not surprising that it's such a big difference. You know, it's such a huge wage gap between sexes, um, but we're going to keep that aside for a moment. Uh, the, the biggest coefficient outside of um, gender is age. And now it kind of makes sense because we're going from the mean, you know, so from from our average our age, which if you go back here is 31. So, you know, if you take 31 uh, for each year above 31, you know, you, you get, um, this, is, this is a linear uh, relationship. So, you know, you get about 10,000 more in salary, but each year below 31, you get 10,000 less, uh, which works uh, for our data set because the lowest uh, age is 21, you know, so, um, a 21 year old is going to be getting about, um, you know, a hundred thousand less than our average uh, age, which is 31. Um, which is fine. It's not going to, you're going to have to be have negative salaries, but then as you go, if you keep going outside of the data, you know, all the way to 15, then suddenly you have a, a negative, um, salary. Um, and we, we saw here that, you know, from 15, so I can do from 15 to 21, you know, this should work a little bit better. Uh, if we want to predict, you know, it's a positive salary of, of 30,000. And from here, we can look at, you know, if we just go a couple of years below that to uh, 18, then um, our salary is almost zero. Uh, I guess in this case, 17 is going to be, uh, and again, this is holding everything as constant. So 17 is the age where you, you start, you still have to pay to work at this company. Um, again, this is just a prediction and we can see how the prediction is, um, it's breaking you know, with this data that 
our model hasn't seen before. Um, so, so, so you can be careful um, about, uh, about, about models. Um, so now I think I'm gonna go back here to talk about the nearest neighbor uh, profiles. Um, So that was just a quick example of the regression. Um, again, you know, this the math behind it is kind of simple. It's kind of like making that best fit line. Uh, it's just that you're not just dealing with one variable; you're dealing with many, so you can't really visualize, you know, the line anymore. Um, but that's all it is. You know, the model is just looking at the data and then trying to minimize. Um, with machine learning, you're always trying to minimize a loss function. Um, you know, if you if you ever taking calculus, you know, if you have a, a, a curve, you know, a line, just minimizing, trying to look at the lowest level. And um, our loss function in this case is the mean squared error, which is the, the error is the distance between the points and your best fit line. So you're trying to draw a line that has the least error, uh, squared error, which is the distance between each individual point and your line. Um, now we're gonna talk about customer churn. So what we did before was uh, regression, which is we're dealing with kind of continuous numerical values. You know, um, so we, we looked at salary. Uh, another thing that we can do is classification. So even the salary example, right? It was numerical. So uh, whatever the salary was, um, 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 well, the 15 year old was a negative salary, so he was paying. But uh, with the 21 year old, it was a pretty low salary. We can take our data and sort of split it into, okay, what's a, what's a low salary, what's a high salary? And you can keep splitting in between uh, low, medium, high. Uh, you can even make brackets, um, you know, into so, uh, am I gonna earn, or should this person earn between 40 and 50,000 or between 50 and 60,000? Uh, in this case, um, we're gonna be kind of putting our data into buckets. Uh, we're gonna be labeling, labeling it. Uh, in this example here in the slide, it's just uh, temperature data. So we have hot or cold. Uh, and we just draw a line where cold ends and hot begins. Um, sometimes the drawing of this line is pretty arbitrary. You know, you can kind of decide, hey, you know, what's this? And that can create some problems on its own. Um, K nearest neighbor, uh, it's another algorithm and kind of just takes uh, points, you know, scare points and just kind of groups them together. Uh, you're gonna, you, when you look at one point, you sort of look at the points near it, you know, the, its nearest neighbor, and you try to group them into the same, into the same, um, this way it's a class, you know, you're giving the same label. Um, so we'll go back um, to, and I'll try to do this one a bit quicker because I know I have a tendency to talk a bit too much. Um, so um, this is another data set and I already kind of preloaded it. And um, in this case, our, our target here is gonna be exited. So this is a, bun a bunch of customers. Um, and we have credit scores. Um, I don't know if everyone would be we we'll know what a credit score is, but you know it's pretty popular at least in the states. Uh, you know everyone has a credit score, and um, if I do here, um, just do this. So again, uh, uh, um, so as soon as this happens, um, I have a cell and it's starting to code. All right, once I code. To describe on this case. Um, and you can see that credit score goes up to 850. Um, and the minimum, which is something that I actually didn't know, is 350. Um, and I think this is accurate. So you American credit scores vary uh, in this, these ranges. Uh, so if you have an 850 credit score, that means that you're good. You're, you're going to get a very low rate on financing when you go to your bank. For, for a loan. Um, and we have all these other um, um, information about our, our customers. Uh, again, Jenner is there. Um, you know, I, I'm, now I can't really tell whether um, 
I'm just going to go and say that one is female again, but age uh, and all, all, all these other things. Uh, has credit card would be if you have a credit card. So either you do or you don't have a credit card of the, uh, of the company, I believe, uh, and whether you are uh, a mem member of the, of the store. And again, we can, we can plot this data. Um, let me try to think here. Um, let's see what would be interesting to to go through. We have but it's for uh, I suppose well. Um, Um, this is a, you know, so again, we're going to do a scatter plot. Uh, data is churned, which you just did. Um, and you know, I will be, okay, I can do this. So just, um, okay, I have this score, right? I do have this score. So it's on, um, whoa, that is, that is a very bad data visualization because, well, it's not bad. Um, it just, you know, it doesn't tell us much, but uh, I was doing with estimated salary on our x-axis and credit score. You know, I, I was kind of thinking that uh, the higher the estimated salary of a customer, the higher the credit score they would have. Well, it kind of looks like it's all over the place. Um, you know, Q uh, is exited, which is whether they are, uh, um, not a customer anymore, I believe. Um, we can, well, you know, so just another thing we can do, instead of estimated salary, then see age. Yeah, age, we should, uh, no, not really. It seems like it's all over the place. Um, kind of funny. Um, but, you know, sometimes you don't, you don't find sort of a simple trending line. Um, but, you know, we can kind of visualize it in a bunch of different ways. Uh, one thing that we can do, um, you know, you can imagine, since we can only see two variables, you can imagine you're making um, graphs for every single combination, you know. So we can have a credit score. Um, so, so, so since we can maybe want to look at credit score, we can look at, you know, um, gender is binary, so that, that that won't be really a scatter plot. Um, it'd be weird as a scatter plot. I can show you guys. Um, so instead of gender, um, we only have two, you know, we have zero or one. We get these vertical lines that are really terrible for visualization. Um, but, you know, besides that, we can, you know, look at everything and we can make a graph for every single one. Um, so just visualize how, 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 it, how one thing, you know, maybe if there's a correlation, um, it's kind of looking mostly like it's all over the place. At least for credit score. Um, but um, again, we'll split the data into targets. Um, I'm just going to do this a bit. Um, this is quick. Just to go, you know, we, uh, we did the same things before. For our X, we just dropped our target. In this case, we saw that we didn't have any categorical um, variables. So, you know, none of the, our. our our features are, you know, the the data types of it. It's kind of string, so we don't have. Um, so, for example, you know, uh, gender, uh, it's not male or female. It's already numerical values, so we don't have to get rid of those. We just get rid. Have to get rid of our target, which is exited. Um, now you you might see that our our targeted our target, which is exited, is also uh, binary. So you know, it doesn't. You know, in this case, so for example, uh, we can't just do the what we did before, which is if we try to um, do a scatter plot, uh, it'll be kind of like the, the scatter plot that I just did with gender. It, it just really doesn't really help because, you know, it's it'd be hard for us to tell um, things like this. Um, sometimes we can, you know, so. Um, 
Netflix. Well, I, I might be small. Anyways, we, we split we split into our, our features and our targets. Our features are columns here um, that we're gonna use as sort of an X. That are gonna these are you know they are influencing our target. Um, and then our um, exit is our Y. You know our, our um, again we gotta uh, import and uh, initialize the model. Uh, in this case, um, we're gonna use the K and N nearest or KNN, the K nearest neighbor specifier. There is a documentation for that as well. Again, for pretty much every thing that we want to use, uh, all Python libraries, there's some documentation that we can look at. Um, if you remember here, we imported our model for, before, right? So from, from secular, we imported our linear regression. It's going to be kind of something similar, um, but we're we are not importing linear regression anymore. We can see here we can um, linear regression is inside of linear model in second learn. Um, K neighbors classifier is inside of neighbors uh, in second learn. So you know we're going to have to do. Let me just make sure that I spell it correctly. Yeah. Instead of neighbors, we want to import uh, the K neighbors. Let's see if, uh, no, uh, sometimes no. Doing live coding is for things wrong, it looks a bit easier. Uh, so now our, um, we're going to initialize this other model. The other one I just called model. Um, I can call it again. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to put uh, neighbors. Equals um, K. And, uh, oh, in this case, we, um, again, there's a lot of part, there's a lot of parameters here that we can define for the model. Um, a lot of the arguments, um, and if you don't, it's just going to take some um, as as the default ones. This isn't the case always, so you know some some things you will have to define. You can't just rely. Um, so one thing that we want to change here maybe is the number of neighbors, but we can I think we just start as, as with five, um, and we're gonna do the same thing. You know, we're gonna we're gonna uh, fit our model on our x and y, um, and we can score it again. Um, so. And um, no, it's you know it's nice. Um, um, here we can we can see some of the some of the. Oh, sorry, I didn't see the perfect. We can see some of the parameters in the model. Um, and in case you had this um, in the in the last one, you saw like score, you saw number. Um, again. Um, uh, our models, they're trying to minimize the loss function, but you sort of score on a metric. Uh, in this case, the metric is already defined for us um, because I didn't um, I didn't define it, right? So it's already here as a default metric, um, Minkowski. Uh, we can always come back and 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 look at, at and read the, you know, here there's an explanation about it uh, on, on the linear regression, same thing, you know, we, um, uh, well, I mean, linear regression, you're just kind of dealing with, with um, the, our, uh, our squared errors. But, you know, you, you are able to, to change this um, in our nearest neighbors. And, you know, again, we can sort of predict. So if you think about uh, all of data set, we can we can get a new data point and sort of predict where it will be. You know, our target to go back is exited. Uh, so with customer churn, you know, it's whether um, there was a um, 
churn, which is, I forget the word for it, but um, uh, whether that has exited or, or not. So in your, I think in your, um, I'm not, I'm not too clear on this actually. So that's why I'm, I'm hesitating. But I think it would be whether your, your, your customer was still like an active customer, you know, whether um, he is actively making purchases. Uh, some, some stores you might have membership. So, you know, you wanna make sure that um, um, you keep your customers. And you can predict just like we, we did before um, of, random, of a random um, data set. You know, we do the 15 year old worker to see the salary. We can predict if a customer has exit or not here based on, you know, um, the, the distance between its nearest neighbors. It's gonna kind of plot something. Um, think of a scatter plot, this one was, was kind of bad. But, um, you know, um, in, in the beginning, we did Let's see. No, we had. Uh, yeah. Um, this is not very clear, but you can imagine that again the hue exited is what we're going to see in our in our in our model. But you can imagine uh, another data set where all the origin orange or orange points are sort of clustered together, and the blue ones are clustered together. Again, we are running this model in all of these different features. The graph only has one. Um, well, in this case, two, all right? So we, we uh, because we are, what we're interested in is this binary exited, we can look at two different features. But um, if we can imagine uh, another, if we just had two features, uh, a data set where the blue and the origin are kind of, or, or, wow, I can't say the color anymore. So, um, you can imagine being kind of maybe not evenly split, you know, so not all blue on the left and orange on the right, but maybe where you can kind of see, well, most of the blue are on the left and most of the, the orange are on the right. And that way, if you plot another point, you're just going to kind of like, well, this one is more on the left. So it's probably going to be blue. This is kind of what the algorithm is doing, but it's doing on many features. So it's a multidimensional graph that we have to plot. Um, um, and just to um, just to come back to an important thing is, um, I'm not sure if it's if it's here or not. Yeah, it's not on, but a very important thing about machine learning is that you don't ever wanna overfit your, uh, your data. So in this case, we're using a whole data to fit a model. But a good practice usually is that you, um, you're gonna take some of your data and you're gonna remove it, you know? So maybe like 20% of your data uh, or 30%, you're just gonna take it out and you're gonna train your model on this, this 70 or 80% of the data. Um, and then you're gonna use that data that you separated to be in the beginning to sort of verify, to see if your model performs on other data. Um, now, this isn't guarantee that your, your model will perform well uh, with other data, with real world data, because uh, we can imagine a case where um, we have a data set, we split some of the, of the data, but the data in the data set is very homogeneous. You know, it's not, um, it, it's not, it doesn't sort of, you can't really extrapolate it to the real world. But if you're using real world data, um, you know, and, and you make sure that your, your data has um, um, all the information that you want to that you want to use. Uh, it's good to to hold some out because what happens is sometimes your your model really fits really well the data that you train it with. Uh, and it's called overfitting, but it doesn't um, it doesn't go it doesn't um, it doesn't fit well data that's outside of the the data that you train to fit your model. So, you know, we, we have saw the metrics here with, uh, with the score. So, you know, we have, um, we have this score for, um, 
for our training data, if we put, when we, when we might think, okay, great, you know, like, uh, so, so sometimes when you're trying to predict um, labels, uh, you care about how accurate uh, your, your model is, you know, or about how precise it is. So you look at accuracy, precision, uh, you know, for you guys that don't know, this is sort of like, um, um, when we come to, to these metrics, sometimes it's about like, how many, um, I, I should, should show you a, a matrix, but it's about, oh yeah, so I can, actually I had this before, you know, we have this uh, confusion matrix, which, um, um, you know, we're talking about true um, positives and, sorry, true classes, what? True positive and true negative versus false positive and false negative. Um, you know, this is something that um, I think nowadays it's, it's quite in, quite popular because, you know, we, we live into a pandemic. So you might think like when you go in to get a test for, for coronavirus, you know, you can have a, a true positive result. You know, you can, you can be sick and, and test positive. Um, I'm not sure if this is the case, but, you know, let's just, let's just imagine that you can also test positive and not be sick. Um, you know, that's going to be a false positive. Uh, and you can, you can be positive and maybe, you know, I don't know, um, you guys ever done the test. Sometimes you, you put the thing in your mouth and maybe it was kind of uncomfortable. So you didn't let them put it in your back of the throat. So maybe you are sick, but you get a false negative result, you know, where you should have been tested positive. Um, uh, so the, 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 the rates of this, you know, sometimes like the true positive rate. So true positive uh, as a percentage of true positive and true negative. Uh, that's how you want to sort of score um, your model sometimes um, with any of these rates. And you might get a score that's great. You know, you, you look at a score and uh, let's say this is 78, but let's say you get like 98%, you know, uh, true positive rate, you know, so you, you identify properly all of your, everyone who's sick, you know, you, you got, you got, a, you got 98% of them right. Um, with your training data, but, um, and this, this is done, so for example, with machine learning examples, this is done a lot with, um, um, uh, imaging um, tests. So uh, I think for breast cancer screening, for example, uh, there's there's algorithms that look in like an X-ray or, or it might be a um, ultrasound. I'm not sure. I've never done a breast cancer screening, at least not yet. Um, fingers crossed. And um, you you have a machine learning model, usually a deep learning model that looks at looks at all these images and um, predicts whether a person has uh, has cancer or not, or has a tumor or not. And you might have a training set that it works great. You know, it gets like 99% of the results and you think amazing. But when you actually go to the real world to, to apply it, you might actually reduce it. You know, it might get like 50%. And that's usually a sign that you are overfitting uh, your model. You're just going on a uh, uh, just really, really making it good for your training data, but it's not generalizing to other world data, to other, to real world data or to data outside of your, um, of your, um, of your training set. And because of that, like we have a, a good solution, um, uh, Scikit-Learn has a good solution, which is it's already sort of done and it's gonna pop and paste here, which is you do a train test split. So, you know, we can import this and um, we can run the same. Uh, same thing, but now um, here, what I just did is I set, uh, before I had set the X and a Y, right? So we have a, we have the, the data set here uh, that we had before without our target, which is exited. That was X and Y was just our target. Now I'm defining four different um, things. You know? So two different X's and two different Y's. Uh, X train and X test and a Y train and Y test. In Python, you can do this when you want to set multiple, multiple variables. You know, you can just use commas. Um, and um, then I'm calling you know, um, train test split because the result in the documentation is when you, when, I'm fitting in my X and my Y, and um, I'm saying the test size is 20%, so it's gonna separate 20% for, uh, for testing. Um, and, um, 
it's going to take that and then return uh, these four things. So you know, it takes two um, um, data frames, you know, um, and in this case, y is in a data frame. It's just it's just one column. You know, it's a NumPy array, but and then it's going to return you know two data frames, and I and I can kind of uh, just so you guys can see, I can sort of call this. So if I do x again, sometimes you put a gonna make sure that you're coding. So I can call x string, and you, know, you can see it's kind of it's, it's been shuffled. It's not by order anymore, and also uh, I have fifty one hundred rows. While before, I'm not sure if we had. Did we visualize it? We did not. Uh, I just called it. Um, one thing that we can do um, is we can, sorry, uh, let me show you in code. Uh, shape, just going to tell you, you know, if you think of a matrix, this means that, you know, it's the, the dimension. So it's 6300 by 10, you know. So I have over 6300 rows and, and columns. This is what we started with. It, now we have um, 58. So you know, I can just call shape again here. Just to, well, so, you know, we, we took, you know, it is 20%, you know, I don't know but, um, it's nine because we had taken out the, our target, um, which was uh, exited. Um, and this split, and it splits, splits kind, of, kind, of, kind of randomly. So you know what we can do again is we can we can run uh, everything that we, we did. You know we can do we can fetch. Um, we, we should initiate another model. Well, we don't have to, but I'm just gonna do. Uh, see, this can be our model two. I'm very lazy. I don't like actually typing stuff. Just and um, we can fit it. And then the difference is we can now we're not gonna fit over x and y like we did before. We're gonna do x train and and then now we can um, just score like we did before on. To do it on next trainer, I would train so you know, let's look. Um, well, that seems to be a terrible score, actually. It's kind of funny. Um, okay. oh, sorry, so that's because I am kind of careless. And I defined our new model as model two, but I'm not fitting model two, I'm fitting model. And if you guys remember, model is the name I gave to our linear regression model, and I simply didn't read this. You know, I'm fitting the linear regression model to this data, it's going to be terrible. That's why we don't use a uh, linear regression model into uh, as a classifier. Um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. But anyway, so now we have a model and I screwed up the whole the other model because now if I try to go back and run that, you know, I'm gonna have uh, the linear regression fit into this one. So you know, when you when you're running a super notebook like this, you should be more organized than me. You know, don't don't make these silly mistakes. Um, and you know, try to remember um, that's why it's good to give nice names to to your models, you know, not model and you know, or model one, model two, but you know, let's, um, yeah, we learn from mistakes, so it's good sometimes to do this. So anyway, so we, we fit again and we score again, uh, way better score, um, you know, kind of similar, what have we done? Okay, so pretty much the same, you know, 78. Um, and, but we, we really, you know, care more about, I'm just gonna, well, I'll open this up, about doing this with, our test set. So you know we did separate this, 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 uh, uh, these, this data set um, in order to test to make sure that our, our model is good and performs well. 
Um, and now we can see, you know, it's it's not as as good. You know, um, we can't we, we train this model. We think, you know, this this is a huge discrepancy, but you know, it, it can be a, a, a important difference because um, we might get the score, you know, if we're just training and think, oh, you know, we have a great great model. And then when you actually test it into data, you know, we're testing our model on data that our model hasn't seen before. You know, we just separated them. We got it from the same um, data set. Um, you know, think about training our model into data that we gathered. Uh, it might be biased data, you know, because sometimes you, you can't just use real world data. Um, you might have to label your own data, uh, which, which we do sometimes. Uh, and, you th and you run it on your on your data set and you think, oh, great, you know, I have this, this great model, look at the score, you know, and then suddenly you go and test it in the real world and it's just not as good. Um, so that is something that you're gonna always be careful about. Uh, that's, this is a simple solution for it. You split your data set into um, training and testing. Um, you can further split it into a validation um, set as well. Um, but we know that our, our score um, isn't as good in the test set than in our train set. Um, anyways, uh, we, um, I'm not going to do a prediction, I'm just going to skip it. I think you guys can kind of already imagine, you know, it's going to just going to be predicting one or zero in our exited, but we can try to explain our model a little bit. Um, so let me see. Um, oh, wow. Um, I, I haven't used this before, so I don't know why it's, um, I have to just look at the, the, the documentation really quick. Um, Sometimes this is what happens when you try to do something on the fly like this. Um, but um, the goal really was just to sort of try to um, explain a little bit. So we are, um, we have a different type of model and you can think back of when we did the linear regression, we had these coefficients. You know, and you can think of the coefficient as sort of like the slope of the line. Uh, these are always, um, you know, you can think like sort of like the weights. So, so if we look, if we look at them, we kind of can see, okay, well, our model is giving a very, very large weight to gender. Um, you know, so sort of like if you wanna, if you just wanna ask one question about a certain employee to determine their um, their salary, you, you probably wanna just ask gender. Um, though that's not always the case, you know, again, that's sort of can be a flawed argument because we know gender, well, we don't know that. In this data set, gender can only be zero and one, right? So even though uh, age has a, a smaller um, weight, you know, like a, a coefficient smaller, uh, we can have a larger spread among age, you know? So uh, yes, we can assume that um, in this case, a female employee is gonna earn about 25,000 less on average than, than a uh, male employee. But, you know, we if someone is quite old, you know, it's about 10 years older than our average employee at 31, then that's a, that's a much larger difference, you know. Um, so, you know, age should be actually the, the most important thing. Um, and that's the same thing that we're trying to do here with the, the our nearest neighbors. We, we aggregate them and kind of see which, which um, feature can be, uh, can be most important. Um, so I'll just go back to our, our nice little pretty slides here. Um, you know, I hope it wasn't, we could, we could sort of follow along at least. I'll just see um, quick. Um, all right, looks like there's some, uh, I got some nice helpers in the chat, so uh, I don't have to go back. Um, 
Um, Carlos, yeah, we'll get the presentation. And, um, you know, you have a little notebooks that you can do online. So, you know, everything that I'm doing here, um, you know, I'm just doing it on my own computer. But um, you can do this because usually you have to, you have to have this, you know, installed in your computer. But nowadays, there's a lot of nice resources that you can, uh, you can just do it online. So you can do it in the browser. Um, um, yeah, someone have a question? Yeah, I'm going to send you guys a link where oh, you, you can access all the slides. And there's also some exercises and you can see the notebooks. So I'm yeah. sending you a link in the chat. Um, it'll be just I, like Vinicius, you can show them, learn. It'll be just the same. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, so. Um, okay. You had it open already. You was on the okay. slides. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks. Uh, yeah. Um, so when you come here to, I guess, so they'll, they'll have the exact same thing, right? That I have. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes. So, so you have here the slides, you know, which uh, is what I was going by. I'll go back. Um, but the cool thing, the really cool thing that we have is this, this platform. So you can go, um, it's, um, you're going to be running this all remotely, right? So when you do uh, processing, uh, this isn't being exec executed in your computer. You can go and uh, use this resource um, and you run this code on someone else's computer, but you can see it through, um, um, it just takes a little while, a little while to open. And there are other resources. So I you know as you're kind of exploring machine learning, uh, there's a lot of online resources that you can do. You know, like a lot of free stuff that you can do. Uh, we are Lay Wagon. You know, we do these workshops to sort of give you a little taste. Uh, there's other resources as well that are good. And when you want to actually code, there's a Google Colab is a pretty cool resource resource that you can use. You know, it's run by Google, it's, it's free. You can go, you can use um, Jupyter Notebooks like this, and you can um, run, you can use like a lot of computing power because sometimes um, this is simple stuff you can run on your computer, but some of these, um, some of these models, especially like deep learning models, if you try to run it on your computer and your laptop, unless you have, you know, an amazing computer, uh, it will take, you know, hours, days, it's just, our computers aren't really equipped to run these things. Uh, and Google Colab lets you do that online. You can use a, a GPU uh, to, to run um, deep learning models, which is something that we do on the work on. And they have a bunch of notebooks sort of um, uh, already done for you to kind of teach you some basic stuff. So uh, if you just Google, Google Colab, um, you know, it's a, it's, a good, it's a good tool. Anyways, um, what you guys will have is this, access to this online. Um, this here is your data. Right, they can. I mean, if you, if you go in here, see two CV, CSV files, comma separated value uh, data sets with churn and salaries. Uh, you know, when you, when you go back, you have two different notebooks. Uh, what I was running is this one, the Strict Life Code, but your guys have better notebooks uh, because they're more detailed. So um, when you go, I'll just go ahead and open the second one. Just in case. But, question, which IDE do you use daily? Sorry? There's a question from James, which IDE do you use daily? Um, well, I do a lot of um, uh, stuff. Mostly I think, you know, we just use different notebooks. Um, and I mean, I know some people might use like PyCharm or Anaconda, which is popular, but with, I think with data science, uh, you can, like Jupyter, Jupyter notebooks are, are I, I usually use Jupyter notebooks. Um, I'm not sure if you know I'm like the best example, but you know you can see how um, the cool things about Jupyter, where you know how you can organize things, um, especially you know if if you're just doing it yourself, you know, James, you know like um, maybe as I was, let's see, um, um, you know. If you're just using yourself, sometimes you just create a bunch of, of, of cells and you're, you know, you're, you're compiling your code and you're executing it. Um, it's, you can do that anywhere. But with Jupyter, um, you know, you can actually, you can write things, you can, um, you can separate them um, 
this isn't the case, but when you, when you, this is a markdown, right? So you can, and then I open a new cell just to hear what you think. Uh, I was mostly doing code, so running code and executing it. But if you go here, you can do markdown. So instead of running code, you can, you can whatever. Um, example, um, and that's going to be written. But one cool thing that we have is sometimes you can number them. Um, and when you number a bunch of them, you know, so in these cases, if they were numbered, over here on the left, you sort of have like a nice little index, sort of, you know, it's separated into chapters. When you have a very large notebook, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very good to organize it in that way, to, uh, to separate things. Uh, when you're doing data exploration, um, you know, you, you say what, you try, what, you, what you're gonna do in this part, um, how you're doing, explain it, um, not only for yourself, I mean, you know, it, it's helpful, but usually you can always kind of figure out your own mess. But um, a lot of times you want to show this to someone. You want to, you know, you want to share with your uh, with your uh, fellow, you know, work buddies. Um, uh, you might want to um, present a project, so it, it becomes pretty, really useful. Uh, and you can make you can make slides just right out of, out of uh, Jupyter notebooks, which is can come in quite handy. But um, anyways, I'll just uh, delete the cell. Um, so um, this is the KNF. So this is what you guys have access to. Uh, it's a notebook. It's nice. You know, it probably takes you through stuff better than I did, to be honest. Um, nice and calm. Um, and a little bit of a Python basics. It tells you a little bit about uh, Jupyter, but also some basic Python stuff. So in case you've never seen Python, I know James said that, you know, he's never seen Python before. Uh, you know, you can kind of kind of see just a little bit of, of how Python works. And we go in to the, uh, to the actual, you know, plot, uh, plotting things. And these cells haven't been run, you know, so uh, uh, again, I can, you, you guys can be able to just run. And when you run cells, you can press here, you can do shift enter. You know, so I can, uh, I can press here and get, and get it running the cell, but you can also just do shift enter, which is a bit easier. Um, if you change stuff and you accidentally delete and you're like, oh, I'm not really sure, just, you know, a good old control Z will bring it back. Uh, and if you do a lot of changes, so, you know, for example, in here, I was doing things like uh, changing um, our X to try and see. So, you know, do tenure. I'm oh, sorry, I'll actually do tenure months, but uh, I'll just do uh, age instead. Um, you know, it'd be useful to draw mini graphs, but you know, in case you just kind of want to play in back and forth, you drew age, you do a bunch of control Z, you go back to years, and you can look. Um, and it will take you through. You can, you can run all this. It's not gonna be run on your computer. So in your case, your computer is like old, uh, you know, and everybody's sure it's like, oh, can I do this? Nice. This is completely, uh, we started doing it on the cloud. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where this is actually running, but um, you know, it's, it's not done. This is just like, um, just going to a website, you know, all the computing power is elsewhere and you can do everything that we did Kind of follows you through it explains pretty nicely um and some other resources same thing with the with the nearest neighbors it's um, um it's very well organized um and i think it's a good way to sort of like demystify um machine learning you know that you can really quickly build a model and train it of course you know you might think oh you know how useful is this um, I mean, we're just, just kind of teaching you, but you, if you actually get some, some training, some real world data, you might be amazed how useful it is, whatever, whatever it is that you're trying to predict. Uh, sometimes, you know, you, you, you run a quick machine learning model and you, you can do a lot better. Um, uh, you know, this is kind of outside of the class, but for example, uh, for you guys that are Brazilian, uh, sometimes we, we have a uh, bolão. Um, you know, it's like a little betting pool that you bet a lot of times with the, the, um, the, 
the soccer, the you know our our Premier League, let's say you know our what we call Brazilian on the 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 A series, and you predict results, you know who's going to win, and you can get some money. Uh, you know uh, most people just kind of guess. And then uh, one time I joined a group of friends, and I um, I didn't really know much about it. I'm not you know I don't follow so much. I just did a quick algorithm to to predict these things and. People looked at my results like, you know, you're just kind of guessing the same thing for every game. Uh, but that's what the algorithm kind of told me to do. Uh, and I ended up winning. Um, people were really pissed because they knew I didn't, didn't know much about soccer and I won the betting thing. But sometimes that's the power of an algorithm. You know, it's, um, it sees, uh, with some things it sees better than we do. Uh, you know, it doesn't have our biases. So, um, just to go back to the slides to finish off, um, you guys are gonna have. Um... Guys, uh, also something to know: Vinicius is one of our students who did both boot camps. He did the web dev at the beginning of last year, and he did the data science at the end of last year. Also, like he just graduated in uh, December of last year. So, if you have questions about web dev or data science, he can help you with both. And I just shared his LinkedIn, if you'd like to have his contact in the chat. You're going to have plenty of LinkedIn invites, Vinicius. <laughs> great, great. I barely use it, so it's probably be good for me to start. Um, yeah, so um, in case uh, I did, so this in this batch, um, I know some people were, um, they, they, they didn't know what to do. Like they kind of wanted to do both, data science and web dev. Um, so I talked to some people about that, you know, they, they kind of wanted to get it. And also in case, if you're curious about the difference, cause you know, they are, they are quite different. You know, I think if you do, um, sorry, if you do one, you know, you can, after you do a web dev, for example, you start data science. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot easier. You know, you already, uh, you might not be doing data science per se, but you know, you, you start programming, you start getting a sense of how things work. It, it makes a lot. It, it makes it a lot easier. And then if you do data science and you're going to you're going to go into web dev, it's as well. It's you know, and you see things that are quite very different. You know, um, the the main difference you might think so one is in Python and one is in um, Ruby. So web dev is done in Ruby. Um, it's a language popular for for web development. Uh, you use a framework called uh, Rails, so you do Ruby and Rails. Uh, Python uh, is sorry. Okay, never mind. Um, I thought that I heard the question, but um, Python is quite um, popular for um, for data science. But Python is also really used for web development. So I know there's people who you might hear them if you go to one of the workshops that they learn Ruby and then they go and work on Python without ever learning Python. I mean, there's just no Ruby and then just kind of guess how Python works and you start working. Uh, and I I think there might be less people doing the reverse, but that's also also true. Um, you know, there are things that we're not gonna do on the, the, the data science bootcamp. So you're not gonna see uh, front end development, right? So you're not gonna work with the JavaScript and uh, you, you do a little bit, but it's like a very, very basic version of it. It's just to display your data um, on a web app, but it, it's not gonna go into depth about it. Um, one thing does, I think, you know, they, they complement each other really well and depending on your interests, are, um, one might be more suited. But I mean, I don't know. I don't know, Milan, if that's the case. I don't know if there's other people that are doing both. But it's definitely. I feel like it's definitely possible for you to go in the in in the area. Um, so you know, if you did web dev, you could follow probably a data science path afterwards, um, just by what you learn in the web dev. You know, just by um, yeah. A lot of it that you learn on the on the bootcamp isn't necessarily, you know, like you're not gonna on a data science bootcamp. Is not, you're not gonna, you know, learn like hardcore like how to prove statistical theorems. Let's say um, you, you're gonna learn how to learn sort of you know how to um, you're gonna learn a lot of stuff, but there's so much that you don't learn in the bootcamp that you have to more more important is for you to be prepared to learn these things on your own later on, because not only is it possible for you to learn everything in nine weeks, and you, we, don't, we learn a lot, but you can't learn everything. 
but also is what's true in data science now, it's probably going to change in a couple of years, you know? So um, uh, it, it's just how, how it goes, you know, like what the tools that we are using um, in data science now, when I, I started trying to learn data science uh, like three or four years ago, we just didn't have all this stuff available. You know, it just wasn't, um, it's a lot easier to learn now. And I'm sure, you know, in five years, things will be completely different. I mean, just, um, it's just that the, the nature of, of computer science. But just to uh, go back, um, sorry, um, we had, oh, we're talking about data leaks, which is, uh, is, which is why it's important to, uh, to split the data set into both. Um, I'm kind of going back to the, the things, um, which I don't, see. I don't know if that's true, but anyways. Um, um, so just to recap a little bit of what we went, we, uh, we went through. So just some basic concepts of machine learning, uh, basics of Jupyter Notebook, which, um, you know, James had asked about, you know, I uh, hear this is number one tool of any data science. It's probably true. I mean, it's, it's very simple to use. It's, it's pretty, it's nice to share with other people. Um, you know, we can, you can take this notebook, you can save it, then you can send it to someone else and they can open in their own, uh, their own machine and then play with it. Uh, we learned how to use some Python libraries. So if you, if you don't remember, that was like scikit-learn, you know, sklearn. Uh, we use Seaborn for, for graphs, for, for those graphs we've done with Seaborn. Um, we use pandas for, uh, the, to make our data into data frames, to nice little tables. Uh, and um, we learned how to build some simple machine learning models, which was, you know, you can see that it's quite quick, quite simple to build some. Um, and we didn't cover a lot of things. Um, I mean, this, this is not gonna be uh, uh, everything that we didn't cover. I mean, there's, there's a lot. So you can do a decision tree models. I don't know if you guys seen it, but you know, you can answer kind of yes or no, and you follow uh, a path. Uh, you can, there's some decision tree based machine learning models, um, probabilistic models, um, logistic models. Um, you can see like, so when you have a binary classes, so for example, classification, we used a nearest neighbors, uh, but you can do this, these logistics models that um, you have this curve and then you, you sort of select a point in this curve where you classify as one and one where you, where you split between zero and one. This is also a very popular for classification tasks. Um, so balance and bias, um, you know, we, if you remember about, I think there's about only 25% of the, the employees on our, on our data set, the salary data set were women. Um, and, you know, you, this, this might not reflect your average company. You know, your average company might be more evenly split between men and women. Um, though some are definitely not balanced at all, especially tech companies. You know, I think you guys probably are aware that, you know, in the tech world, there's, there's a lot of debate over representation of women, uh, representation of minorities as well. Um, you know, um, you, get, you get some problems when not only uh, we, we struggle when we have a data that's sort of biased, but if you think about it, um, um, recently there was a famous case in Google, they fired this AI researcher, or AI, I'm sure she was an AI ethics researcher. So, you know, she, she talked about uh, the problems, moral problems with AI. And I think one of the big things, the, the reason why she was fired I might be butchering this, but as I understand it, is that she she published a paper which Google didn't want her to put her name on, or I'm, I'm not sure exactly how that was, but the paper sort of talked about how uh, in natural language processing. So when we were teaching um, our models, you know, how to how to process language, how you know maybe chatbots, um, how most of it, most of the stuff that we use to train is sort of Western. Um, data, you know, so data from rich countries, um, perhaps mostly white countries, and how this could create problems in the future when you talk, when you're trying to use that for, for, other, for other countries. Um, and, you know, if we, we just have 
um, one type of people doing your data, you know, that could create problems as well, because sometimes you need some, some diversity, uh, not only of data, but of minds working with the data. So you can see different patterns, maybe understand it better. Um, unfortunately, I'd say that this data probably represents reality well, at least in some fields, some areas, probably in some countries. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not too, uh, too knowledgeable about income distribution data, um, but it seems like, you know, it, unfortunately it does represent. Um, we also didn't work, didn't talk at all about making a product. So we just wrote a Jupyter notebook, right? Uh, which is pretty, it's, it's very easy to use, um, but sometimes you might wanna use this, um, our, our, our models to make maybe like a little dashboard like we have here on the top right, you know, Maybe like sometimes you, you take this dashboard that just displays data in many different ways, in intuitive ways for someone just to look at it and quickly kind of see uh, what the data is telling us. Um, a lot of data science, I think, ends up just being that, you know, creating, you, you make look nice little data pipelines where you're constantly taking data and updating it and then displaying it in intuitive ways so that maybe, uh, you know, your manager or your CEO or something can just look at it and, and see the, the important things that, that matter to him. Um, well, Google, you know, is, you know, their, their algorithm, searching algorithm, you know, is a nice product. Um, so, um, yeah, so just to bring back is machine learning and domain knowledge. So it's, it's great to be able to build models and play with data, but in the end, you know, what we need most of is, you know, people that are, are very knowledgeable about some topics. And then being able to, you know, whatever work you already do, whatever analysis you already do, if you're making recommendations, if you're making predictions, you know, machine learning models, um, you know, use, using machine learning is just another tool. So, you know, perhaps um, you can revolutionize a field like a lot of fields have done with, with machine learning, you know, because you already are doing something, but uh, it's just a much more powerful tool. But you still require that domain knowledge. I mean, you still have to, um, you know, it's not going to be um, like nowadays you have a lot of people that are, oh, you know, this is like, you know, I'm going to take Uber and it's an Uber for whatever, uh, for pets, for example, you know, it's a lot of apps like that um, might be uh, making fun of a specific app. But, you know, you have a lot of things that you're just trying to take something that already works and say, like, oh, apply that for that, apply that for, for that, this domain. Uh, sometimes that works, you know, um, especially with machine learning is such a powerful tool that it can, um, it, it sometimes it can be better, you know, you being ignorant about a, a, a domain, uh, machine learning just boosts you up so much that your ignorance doesn't matter as much. Um, but it's, it's very helpful to have some domain, domain knowledge, you know, and to know that this is a tool, it's a powerful tool, but you still need to understand what you, what you want to do with it. Um, you know, you, you need to know a problem that you want to solve. You can't just say, oh, you know, I'm going to just apply machine learning uh, randomly. Um, it might just be a waste of, of computer power and time. And yeah, that's you. you know, that's you guys that come from other fields. Uh, thanks again for listening. I hope, you know, I didn't put you to sleep or I didn't bore you too much. Um, and that you learned something, at least know some basic things. Um, we have a lot of other workshops like this uh, with, uh, with data and with web, dev, web development. So there's always things, if, if you guys are curious, there's a lot of resources online also. I hope you guys at least check out the learn page. Uh, so just go back to it. Um, you know, check this out, at least play with it quickly. Um, you know, you can run through the cells quite quickly by yourself. And I think that just makes a difference. Um, you know, it's so much more powerful learning when you sort of do yourself and watching someone do it. So if you just kind of go through it and try to see what, it, what it's doing, because um, anything you don't want to understand, you know, you can, you can find in the documentation, uh, the notebook already takes you through, but, um, you know, sometimes just, just seeing it, just doing yourself a little bit, uh, makes it seem like it's, okay, I can do this, you know, while before you see it, sometimes you think, oh no, you know, this is too hard, I got to take, you know, maybe I got to go back to school and study statistics and study computer science and, you know, or else I can never do this. But, you know, nowadays, 
we have a lot of tools, a lot of really powerful tools that allow you to like, I would say allow pretty much anyone to, to start playing with it, to, to start building some models, at least simple models. And you, learn, you can learn along the way. Um, so yeah, thanks guys. Uh, Milan, I'm not sure if, um, uh, thanks. Thanks, Julia, I appreciate it. Uh, Brando, um, my pleasure. Um, um, <laughs> so cute. Fofo, fofura. Thanks. Um, Guys, if you if you'd like to speak directly to us, you can uh, unmute yourself, put your video. Oh, sure. You can also just uh, use a chat if you're shy. We respect that. <laughs> if you'd like to speak uh, to me or to Vinicius, feel free. I think in, in normal times, in normal times, this is uh, it, what? You know, in normal times, not non-pandemic times. You know, this is a lot better because, as as I remember, you know, we we'd be doing this in person. It's a lot easier to talk. To, uh, to, you know, um, when, when I did a, a, a workshop a, a while ago, about a year ago, I think, right before the pandemic, you know, you were able to talk to everyone else. So, you know, you, you see uh, people who are interested in, in data science, like you can kind of see where they're coming from. Uh, sometimes that's helpful because, you know, you see, okay, you know, you see someone's background and you think, oh, you know, uh, it's kind of similar to mine, I can do it. Sometimes it can't not be helpful. For example, for me, I had this one guy who was interested and this guy seems to already know everything. Um, so, you know, it kind of puts you down, but believe me, I started from, you know, pretty basic beginnings. Um, you know, I'm not gonna say I'm like a master um, in machine learning, but from very basic things, you know, you can, you can do a lot of, a lot of really powerful models. Uh, uh, if you guys, um, I think we have we have the demo day online, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, like, in case, yeah. in case on the YouTube channel, like, there's a uh, demo day is when we present our final projects, uh, and these presentations are about like five minutes long. So, you know, in case you want to see like what what the result is, right? You can go to the demo day, and you can see a presentation. It's about five minutes long, and just kind of sees like in nine weeks what you end up building in the end. And the, and the fact that you, the final is like you build something like an actual working model that's meant to solve a particular problem, you know, that helps a lot because you're not just learning theory, you're learning really applied um, things. So um, um, yeah, guys, you're welcome. Um, thanks for listening. It's my first time doing this workshop. So I was pretty nervous. I hope I didn't butcher too much, but um, James asked how it works. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I can answer. Yeah, okay. I was actually on YouTube, I was looking for your demo day, Vinicius, when I sent it to you. I want to oh. send it to the students. Uh, okay. If you want to see Vinicius demo day. I didn't present. It was someone else that was in my group. But... Ah, found it. Yeah. Okay, guys, I'm going to um. send on that the demo day of Vinicius if you want to see uh, the projects that were developed just a month ago. Um, yeah, uh, so how does a bootcamp work? So if you choose a full time, which is two months, Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. till 7 p.m., every single, every single day uh, starts the same way. Uh, from 9 a.m. until 10.30, you have class. From 10.30 until 5 in the afternoon, you just practice, 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 just exercise all day long, whether it's uh, development, programming basics, or uh, Python, SQL, it's the subject of the day uh, and something specific, sure. to yeah. something specific to Le Wagon is that every single day you will match with another student. So you are never alone. You're always working with another student, even if it's still, of course, a quite solitary activity, you're still working with someone else. And something also that explains why you learn so fast is because you always have the teachers with you. Uh, you always have two teachers with you all day long. And we have a rule at Le Wagon that if you're stuck for more than 15 minutes, you call the teacher. And the teacher will never give you the answer. They will tell you, okay, Vinicius, what are you trying to do here? And they will try to give you the next steps, uh, try to see what's not clear. So that's why you learn so fast, because I think most of us, I mean, if, if we're all here today, it's because we try to learn by ourselves. Um, everybody who has this experience, you know that when you're stuck and you have no one to help you, you're stuck for real. <laughs> you can be stuck for two days on something and you don't, cannot move forward. That's why your learning can be slower than when you do a bootcamp. 
Uh, so this, you have one hour to have lunch. And then by the end of the day, we have something called a recap. It's either an exercise you do together, all together with the students and the teacher, or it's like a recap of the day, depending on the days. Uh, and for the part time, it's exactly the same format, except uh, you don't watch the class live, you watch a video of it, so it gives you more flexibility. Uh, and otherwise, it's the same on Tuesday and Thursday night and Saturday all day you come, uh, whether it's online or presential, and you do the exercises with everybody. It's exactly the same, except it's on six months instead of two months. It's just more spread, spread out on the months. Any other question about the bootcamp, about Vinicius, about learning uh, about that Python, SQL, anything? Okay. <laughs> Um, and I just want to say thanks to to this. Um, I always I will not open my camera because I'm really really shy as well. Okay, like that. <laughs> I always thought that machine learning was like a seven head monster with you know how this this difficult and something like that, like in artificial intelligence as well. But after today, you know, I've, I get this feeling like, oh man, like I can learn this. <laughs> like no. I get really. I don't know how to say the word, like really motivated to study, to do the boot camp or something like that. And that's thanks to you, Vinicius. I, I, I see that you are really, really nervous about it, but dude, you really did, did it really great. Like, thanks. <laughs> thank you thanks. for that. Thank you um, yeah, I, I think, you know, like if that's the case, because I, man, I, so before I, I felt the same thing, you know, like I was very like intimidated and I, um, I thought, you know, like I had done like statistics in back in college, you know, because I studied economics. And so I had seen some of this stuff, you know, so we you do a lot of regression when you study economics. But a lot of the other stuff was just really intimidating. I just looked at it and I was like, I, I, I don't know, like, I can't do this. You try to look at the actual algorithm sometimes and it's, it's, I, I think it's normal. You know, if, if you're not intimidated by it, you're probably just like, I don't know, math just comes like very easy for you or something, but I think most people are a bit intimidated and um, not only this, so if you go through the notebook and maybe do it yourself, just, just get a sense of it. Um, there's some other stuff online. So like maybe if you want to look in, in the Google Colab, um, I, I, I don't remember now, but I remember like they have some stuff that is kind of like, because it, it's sort of a teaching tool, you know, that Google displays it. And when it comes to deep learning, so, you know, deep learning, we didn't do this, but it's a, a Part of machine learning, right? And it's uh, you have uh, neural networks, which is like kind of model into how the brain works. But anyways, you have these models that are full of layers, and all of these like even the words. So when you talk, when you hear someone talk about it, the words that they use sound hard, right? So you you talk about like you know I was trying to explain like you know we have the columns, and but this is features. You know this is what we say features, and we have the target. Um, so sometimes you, talk about, you, you hear someone talking about like feature engineering. And it sounds like really complex, but sometimes feature engineering is like you make another column and that column is just equals to the sum of two other columns, you know, and that's like feature engineering. Um, and <laughs> you have other, I, it's really not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say that this stuff is easy because, you know, it, it, it isn't easy, but it's just like, uh, like Diego was saying, it's like, it seems like a seven headed monster, but yeah. when you actually like learn it, you're like, okay, it's, it's not easy, but it's definitely not as hard as I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And when you do, um, you know, you, you do these simple regressions and stuff, it's like, it's cool. But uh, at least in my, my experience, when I did my first like deep learning model, so, you know, it was a computer vision um, model, you know, so you, we took images. And if you look at our, our, um, our final projects, it was about doing satellite imaging. You know, you take a bunch of images and you actually do something that can see images and classify them. Like the thing, if I if I had seen it before the boot camp, I, it just looks like no, this is rocket science. It's it's impossible. Um, it's not necessarily easy, but when you do one, I think this is such a huge step because you do it in like, you know, like holy shit, like I was able to do it. like I I made that, right? Um, and with just simple steps, like you just follow along simple steps. A lot of like obviously, the models that you see online, you know, like the famous ones that go in the paper, 
um, they are a bit more complex, right? Like the guys doing that, you know, have PhDs and stuff, but you can replicate, replicate this a bit in like a day, some of the stuff, because you can have resources online nowadays that make it super easy. Uh, you can build, you can take models sort of like off the shelf that already pre-trained pre -trained for you. You just apply it to your data and you run it and suddenly you have something and it's pretty amazing. Um, so I would, I would definitely suggest like, if you, if you guys are here, you're probably interested, just kind of try it out. You know, like there's some resources that you can kind of do it really quickly um, and see how you feel because you might look at it completely different after building something yourself and applying it. Um, even though you're going to be following instructions from someone, it's um, like, at least confidence wise, it's, it builds your confidence a lot. And then even if you do the boot, the boot camp, at least you learn a little bit about it. And then maybe you have a nice little interview in the future. And then someone talks about it. And then you just kind of explain a little bit of machine learning for them. And trust me, like that can, that can help a lot. <laughs> You know, because that's impressive. It's like, oh man, this guy, you know, like you don't have to like actually know how to do it. You just, you understand the concepts. You talk a little bit about them. And it's, you know, I know a lot of other people that do this, they don't go on to be data scientists necessarily. You know, you learn about it, but you, you just end up working somewhere that you got to deal with data scientists. So you can talk in the same language. That helps a lot. You know, it's just about like knowing terms. Uh, I think like just makes it so much better. Cause then when you read, when you want to talk about something, you know, oh, you know, in the column, whenever someone talks about, oh, you know, I was looking in the feature, doing some feature engineering. Uh, it looks like the metrics, you know, our score is a bit low and you don't know what you're talking about. Now you know what you're talking about. So you can at least communicate. And yeah, it's a, it's a valuable skill. So. Um, and is our question guys about the industry about life, <laughs> we can't answer anything. We can't show life. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we don't know everything, but like, I, I just, I'm very passionate about this just because at least for me, the, my confidence was not very high. Like I'm not the most confident person, but um, you know, when you're doing the boot camp, you like, I think things seem easy afterwards. And one thing is that I never had in my life before in the boot camp is I always, when I was applying for work, you know, you look at the requirements, like, oh, what do you need for this job? And I would look at it, I'm like, ah, you know, I have some of them, I don't have all, you know, you, you kind of try to stretch the truth a little bit, let's say, you know, uh, I'm not going to say lying, but, you know, uh, after the boot camp, when you look at jobs for like de development and stuff, at least for me, it was the first time in my life that I saw the requirements for a job and I could say, I know every single thing that they ask, um, you know, um, some, some, some things still like they ask for too much experience for a job. You know, um, I think one of the, one of the common jokes that some, that I've heard with recruiters is, so for example, you might have um, a software that we use and the software is like two years old, you know, it's only, it's only existed for two years. And then you go to apply for a job and it's it asked for like, you know, preferred qualifications and they're like five plus years of experience using this software. The software doesn't even exist for five years, you know, and they're asking for someone that has five years plus of experience. Uh, obviously, sometimes when they build these things, they don't really know uh, what it is, how old it is, but, um, you know. It's it, the ones who, who draft the job posts, it's like HR people that have no idea about what they ask. Yeah. Um, yeah in Brazil, this is a really issue, right? They ask like, we have to, you need to have a Nobel Prize if you want to be a developer here. <laughs> Uh, you need to yeah. be in C, C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, SQL. Yeah. <laughs> Three years plus of experience to a junior. <laughs> in each single language. <laughs> yeah, and even speak Japanese a little bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, but but I think in this in this field at least, you know, when it, when it comes to like you know, it it is a little bit. I think it makes more sense because they want experience, like building something. Actually, you know, so you're not gonna have that, that, oh, we need good communication skills and these kind of like soft skills that like, obviously soft skills are extremely important, but you know, sometimes it's hard to measure, but you know, if they need you to build an app, for example, or, you know, you need to build a simple like um, data pipeline, you can show like, okay, I've done this. You know, it might have a little portfolio as well or something. Uh, it's quite popular for you to, uh, you know, when you, when you programmers, you have like a GitHub where somewhere uh, account where is where you push your code 
So when you're working on a project with multiple people, you're coding on your computer, but your, your, your teammates are also coding on their computer and you have a, a central repository where all that stuff is stored. You know, usually on like GitHub is quite popular. So, you know, they can see, okay, this guy worked on so many projects and they see like how much you worked on it, the code that you wrote. Uh, and that kind of becomes a bit easier too, to show like, hey, this is the experience that I have. Um, you, can, you can look at my GitHub page uh, or, or some other areas. Right? If you build like a web app, they can like, oh, here, you can look at my web app. Um, so. Good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys so much for being with us, being this workshop.